Birmingham was once known as a city of a thousand trades. By the time the Industrial Revolution came around, Birmingham was producing almost anything and everything that you can think of for use across the globe. But how did we get here? How did we change from the workshop of the world to where we are today? Well, in this episode of Birmingham Through the Ages, we're exploring industry. To start off our journey, I need to find out what Birmingham was like before the Industrial Revolution and how its landscape has changed throughout it. So there's no better place to go than Sarah Hall Mill and to find out how that changed throughout history and how that impacted a little boy by the name of J.R.R. Tolkien. We are in one of uh, only two uh, water mills left in Birmingham is able to, to grind uh, corn. We're currently undergoing some restoration work to the, to the mill itself but we were a rare survivor from the uh, time when this part of Birmingham was in the green pleasant land of Worcestershire. So the mill is um, surrounded now by uh, the suburbs, but once sort of sat uh, at the heart of the community of Serhole, grinding corn for the local people. There's been a mill here since the 1540s, um, and the earlier mill um, was associated with uh, Matthew Bolton, who leased the site in the 1750s. And it was here that he was uh, using the mill to roll metal that was then taken into to Birmingham to be made into the, the buttons, trinkets and toys that he was famed for. Um, so even though it has its roots in the agrarian society or the, the countryside, it still wasn't too far away from Birmingham that it was still being used for, for those industrial purposes. And throughout its life, it's been used um, for a number of things, primarily for grinding uh, corn, but also for blade grinding and metal rolling as well. So the, the current buildings that we have are rebuilt in the 1760s and were in use uh, for milling until 1919. The industrialisation um, of the area, going back in the time of the Industrial Revolution, we were three miles from, from Birmingham and so a lot of work was coming from Birmingham to here. But the mill itself wasn't isolated from uh, mechanisation. It's the reason behind you have the large chimney so in the 1850s that was installed for uh, purposes to make the mill grind when the water levels were low. And over a period of, uh, of time you can overlay maps and see the changes that took place as the surrounding area grew and expanded to provide homes, and particularly with the railway boom, that Serhole uh, started to become isolated and become, in the words of Tolkien, summed up an island of lost paradise. Tolkien moved from South Africa as a three-year-old boy and he lived here for four years and in his own words they're the four longest seeming but most formative. And while he was here he was in, absolutely enthralled by the English countryside and he would say he could map every inch of this place from, from memory and him and his young brother Hilary would often go on adventures which normally involved trespassing across other landowners land. So Tolkien's reaction to industrialisation um, started as a young age. As a young boy the tree the very few trees that grew on the side of the pool. Uh, he used to climb them, draw them, talk to them and treat them as if they were a person. And then one day uh, that tree was cut down and left to rot on the bank and it had a profound effect on what we would have described as wanton vandalism. And it stayed with him for all his life and there's a recurring motif through his work of trees that are cut down, left to rot and don't serve any purpose. And where he used to live at Edgebaston, he'd be able to stand near Edgebaston Reservoir and look on one side of the reservoir, the green hills rising up. On the other side, a sea of factories blowing out smoke over the other side of Birmingham. And when he came back to, um, to Birmingham and went to saw Serhole Mill, when he was expecting to see Serhole as he remembered, he recalls calling it a meaningless tram-ridden suburb alive with motor cars and crossings. He was aware that you have to have machines, but it was at what cost? And he was a very early on one of the few who was championing the cause of the green spaces and the outdoors. And as he was walking as an older man, that childhood experience of that tree being cut down, he described what he saw as industrial damage, as orc damage. Well, it looks like Tolkien wasn't exactly the biggest fan of the way the world was headed with the Industrial Revolution. So now let's take a look at how the Industrial Revolution could have been used for the better and somebody who tried to pursue that better world. And that means taking a trip to Soho House. Soho House was the home of Matthew Bolton during the 18th century. Uh, Matthew Bolton was one of the great industrialists of Birmingham and he really sort of set alight the industrial revolution in the city and in the region as well. So despite Soho House being a small site, its history is 
massive. It's so important to the region and to the city. Um, right from the start, when Matthew Bolton took over it, it was really the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but what Matthew Bolton did at Soho House, he built his manufactory, the first factory in the world, right next to this house, uh, and really started a process which changed the face of the, industri in the Industrial Revolution, along with many of his friends and colleagues who met here at Soho House uh, in a society called the Lunar Society. So the people involved in the Lunar Society were polymaths. They were interested in a variety of different um, avenues, uh, different interests as well, because what they were focused on was developing themselves, both uh, from an intellectual perspective, but also developing society when it comes to technolo technological and scientific development. We're stood in the lunar room itself, and it's in this room where they would have had held their meetings every full moon. Uh, that only that helped because it was easier to be able to get home. It illuminated the road back home. It was a period of inventiveness and technological development which was spearheaded by um, societies like the Lunar Society. You have Matthew Bolton who built the first manufactory and uh, was part of the first modern coin, manu uh, coin mint in the world as well. Uh, he was supported by James Watt who really revolutionised the steam engine. Uh, before that it was a very inefficient engine. But what James Watt did was created an efficient engine which allowed the steam engines be used in a multitude of, uh, of ways which turn power into something which we could harness uh, rather than using animal power or human power or water power. Steam power became central to everything what happened in, in, uh, in the UK and, and in the world as well. Uh, but you also have Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, who is so well known for the origin of species. It was Erasmus Darwin, his grandfather, Charles Darwin's grandfather, who really provided and really sort of developed these ideas early on. Uh, which allowed the theory of evolution to really be spearheaded by Charles Darwin himself. When Matthew Bolton bought the house, it was only a small little cottage at the time, but Matthew Bolton uh, developed and built it up into what he wanted to see Soho House like, with, is, is what you see this neoclassical mansion today. Uh, but since we're after Matthew Bolton died, that's not when the history ends. Soho House became this sort of almost isolated property in what was an expanding Birmingham, it, what, in what but a Birmingham that actually became far more residential. So this is why how Soho House actually developed, but it had many uses after that. It became a Victorian girls' school, it became uh, a vicarage, it became a hotel as well for a period of time. Uh, during uh, its period as a hotel, it also acted as an air raid shelter during World War II and during the Battle of Britain. Uh, following that, you've got it as somewhere to house General, General Electric Company employees. Following that, it also became a police hostel. And so there's so much history following the death of Matthew Bolton that this is something we really want to talk about here. Matthew Bolton certainly sounds like he was an important pioneer in the Industrial Revolution. And who knows, if him and other great like-minded inventors didn't meet in a big white house outside of Birmingham, then maybe you wouldn't even be watching this video. To find out how these great minds like Bolton and what shaped the modern world, I'm off to the incredible site that is Think Tank. Uh, this is what we refer to as the Smedic engine. Built by James Watt and Matthew Bolton in the 1770s. It's the oldest working steam engine in the world and it's also got James Watt's famous little trickery on it, the condenser, that makes, sets it apart from all the other steam engines that were trying to be built around that time. Steam engines were around before James Watt and they worked but they went through an awful lot of coal so they're viable if you're running an engine on a coal field or in a coal mine. But anywhere else like a factory in the middle of Birmingham you tend not to have a pile of coal directly outside. The condenser that was fitted to this engine managed to make it a whole lot more efficient so you can get away with a sack full of coal instead of a shed full of coal. This lovely machine has one purpose which is to collect water from the bottom of the hill and pour it back into the top. So it keeps the locks and the canals full of water so boats can keep going through all day and all night. This engine is moving something like a tonne of water on each full of this lovely seesaw beam assembly that we see.
Everyone that I've spoken to along this journey has noted that Birmingham and its people have produced some absolutely incredible things and it's clear that the modern world as we know it today would be a very different place if Birmingham hadn't been a part of it. But they've also noted that despite these great innovations in technology and industry, we also need to be careful and to understand the repercussions of these incredible inventions and how they affect our natural world. Join me next week as we explore how Birmingham has changed the world of food and more in the next episode of Birmingham Through the Ages.